Good afternoon. We are going to um, finish up in Ephesians today. Ephesians 5 and Ephesians 6. So, um, let's go ahead and start in a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for this day, and I praise you for this day, and I worship you, Lord, I worship you. And I thank you for this word, Lord. Let it saturate in our hearts, and let, let us teach us what we need to learn from you, Lord. Give us the words through this. Give us understanding and knowledge through your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Ephesians 5. Be ye therefore fellow... Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smell and savour. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetous, let it not be let it not be once named among you as become saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an adulterer, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are not done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever does make manifest is light. Wherefore he says, Awake! Thou that sleepest and rise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so that the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might pre present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies? He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherish it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, 
and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is the great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So in chapter 5, we see that um, exhortation to brotherly love, cautions against several sins, directions to a contrary behavior, and to relative duties. The duties of wives and husbands are enforced by the spiritual relation between Christ and the church. Because God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Therefore be ye followers of God, imitators of God. Resemble him, especially in his love and pardon goodness, as becomes those beloved by their heavenly Father. And Christ sacrifices his love triumphs, and we are to consider it fully. Filthy lust must be rooted out. These sins must be dreaded and detested. Here are not only cautions against gross acts of sin, but against what some may make light of. But these things are so far from being profitable that they pollute and poison the hearers. Our cheerfulness should show itself as become Christians and what may tend to God's glory. A covetous man makes a God of his money places that hope, confidence, and delight in worldly good which should be in God only. Those who allow themselves either in the lust of the pleasure of the, or the love of the world belong not in the kingdom of grace, not nor shall they come to the kingdom of glory. When the vilest transgressors repent and believe the gospel, they become children of obedience from whom God's wrath is turned away. Dare we make light of that which brings down the wrath of God? Sinners, like men in, that do in the dark, are going they know not whither, and doing they know not what. But the grace of God wrought a mighty change in the souls of many. Walk as children of light, as having a knowledge and holiness. These works of impenitent sinners these words of darkness are unfruitful. Whatever profit they may boast, for they end in the destruction of the impenitent sinner. There are many ways of abetting or taking part in sins of others by com commendation, counsel, consent, or concealment. And if we share with others in their sins, we must expect to share in their plagues. If we do not reprove the sins of others, we have fellowship with him. A good man will be ashamed to speak of what many wicked men are not ashamed to do. We must have not only a sight and a knowledge that sin is sin, and in some measure shameful, but see it is as a breach of God's holy law. After the example of prophets and apostles, we should call on them, those asleep and dead in sin to awake and rise that Christ may give them life. Another remedy against sin is care or caution, it being impossible else to maintain purity of heart and life. Time is a talent given us by God, and it is mispent and lost when not employed according to his design. If we have lost our time heretofore, we must double our diligence for the future. Of that time which thousands are on a dying bed would gladly redeem at the price of the whole world, how little do men think, and to what trifles they daily sacrifice it. People are very apt to complain of bad times, it were well if that stirred them more to redeem time. Be not unwise. Ignorance of our duty and neglect of our souls show the greatest folly. Drunkenness is a sin that never goes along, but carries man into the other evils. 
It is a sin very provoking to God. The drunkard holds out to his family and to the world the sad spectacle of a sinner hardened beyond what is common and hastening to perdition. When afflicted or aware, let us not seek to raise our spirits by strong drink, which is hateful and hurtful and only ends in making sorrows more felt. But by fervent prayer, let us seek to be filled with the Spirit and to avoid whatever may grief a gracious comforter. All God's people have reason to sing for joy. Though we are not always singing, we should be always giving thanks. We should never want this position of this duty, for this duty, as we never want matter for it. Through the whole course of our lives, always even in trials and afflictions and for all things being satisfied of their loving intent and good tendency, God keeps believers from sinning against him and engages them to submit one to another in all he has commanded to promote his glory and to fulfill their duties to each other. The duty of wives is submission to their husbands and the Lord, which includes honoring and obeying them from a principle of love to them. The duty of husbands is to love their wives. The love of Christ is to the church is an example which is sincere, pure, and constant, notwithstanding her failures. Christ gave himself for the church that he might sanctify it in this world and glorify it in the next, that he might bestow on it all his members a, a principle of holiness and liberty from the guilt, the pollution, and the dominion of sin by those influences of the Holy Spirit of which baptismal water was the outward sign. The church and believers will not be without spot or wrinkle till they come to glory. But those only who are sanctified now shall be glorified hereafter. The words of Adam mentioned by the apostle are spoken literally of marriage, but they have also hidden a sense in them relating to the union between Christ and his church. It was the kind of type as having resemblance. There will be failures and defects on both sides. In the present state of human nature, yet this does not alter the relation. All the duties of marriage are included in unity and love. And while we adore and rejoice in the condensing love of Christ, let husbands and wives learn hence their duties to each other. Thus the words thus the worst evils would be prevented and many painful effects would be avoided. So let's finish up in Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as man pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. With good will doing service as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your masters also is also in heaven, neither is there respect to a persons with him. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against 
flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fear of darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak but that ye also may know my affairs and how I do. Tychius, a beloved brother and faithful minister and Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that ye may know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to you, the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all of them, that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. So to review chapter 6, it talks about the duties of the children and parents, and the servants and masters. All Christians are to put on spiritual armor against the enemies of their souls. And the apostle desires their prayers and ends with his apostolic blessing. The great duty of children is to obey their parents. That obedience includes inward reverence as well as outward acts. The duty of parents, be not impatient, use no unreasonable service, deal prudently and wisely with children, convince their judgments and work upon their reason, bring them up well under proper and compassionate correction, and in the knowledge of their duty God requires. Often is this duty neglected, even among professors of the gospel. Many set their children against religion, but this does not excuse the children's disobedience. Though it may be awfully occasioned, it, it may be awfully occasioned. God alone can change the heart, yet he gives his blessing to the good lessons and the examples of parents and answers their prayers. But those whose chief anxiety is that their children should be rich and accomplish whatever becomes of their souls must not look for the blessing of God. The duty of servants is summoned up in one word, obedience. The servants of all, all were generally slaves. The apostles were to teach servants and masters their duties, in doing which evils would be lessened. Till slavery should be rooted out by the influence of Christianity, servants are to reverence those over them. They are to be sincere, not pretending obedience when they mean, when they mean to disobey, but serving faithfully. Excuse me. Excuse me for that. And they must serve their masters not only when their master's eye is upon them, but must be strict in the discharge of their duty when he is absent and out of the way. Steady regard to the Lord Jesus Christ will make men faithful and sincere in every station, not grudgingly or by constraint, but from a principle of love to the masters and their concerns. This makes service easy to them, pleasing to their masters, and acceptable to the Lord Christ. God will reward even the meanest drudgery done from a sense of duty and with a view to glorify Him. Here is the duty of masters. 
act after the same manner. Be just to servants as you expect they should be to you. Show the good, the light goodwill and concern for them. And be careful herein to approve yourselves to God. Be not tyrannical and overbearing. You have a master to obey. And you and they are but fellow servants in respect to Christ Jesus. If masters and servants would consider their duties to God and the account they must shortly give to him, they would be more mindful of their duty to each other and thus families would be more orderly and happy. Whew, excuse me a minute, I'm getting thirsty. Spiritual strength and courage are needed for a spiritual warfare and suffering. Those who would prove themselves to have true grace must aim at all grace and put on the whole armor of God which he prepares and be so. The Christian armor is made to be worn and there is no putting off of our armor till we have done our warfare and finished our course. The combat is not against human beings nor against our own corrupt nature only. We have to do with an enemy who has a thousand ways of the we have to do with an enemy who has a thousand ways of beguiling unstable souls. The devil of the souls and the things that belong to our souls and labor to deface the heavenly image in our hearts. We must resolve by God's grace not to yield to Satan. Resist him and he will flee. If we give way, he will get ground. If we distrust either our cause or our leader or our armor, we give him advantage. The different parts of the armor of heavy armed soldiers who had to, to sustain the fierce, fiercest assaults of the enemy are here described. There is none for the back, nothing to defend those who turn back into Christian warfare. Truth or sincerity is the girdle. This girds on all the other pieces of our armor. And it's first mentioned, there can be no religion without sincerity. The righteousness of Christ inputted to us is a breastplate against the arrows of divine wrath. The righteousness of Christ implanted in us fortifies the heart against the attacks of Satan. Resolution must be as greaves, greaves, or armor to our legs, and to stand their ground, or to march forward and rugged paths. The feet must be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Motives to obedience to miss trials must be drawn from the clear knowledge of the gospel. Faith is all in all in an hour of temptation. Faith as relying on unseen knowledge of the gospel. Faith is all in all an hour of temptation. Faith as relying on unseen objects, receiving Christ and the benefits of redemption. And so deriving grace from him is like a shield, a defense every way. The devil is a wicked one. Violent temptations by which the soul is set on fire of hell, or dark Satan shoots at us. Also hard thoughts of God and as to ourselves. Faith applying the word of God and the grace of Christ quenches the darts of temptation. Salvation must be our helmet, a good hope of salvation, a scriptural expectation a victory will purify the soul and keep it from being defiled by Satan. To the Christian armed for defense in battle, the apostle recommends only one weapon of attack, but it is enough the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And the grace of Christ quenches the darts of victory, of temptation. 
Salvation must be our helmet, a good hope of salvation. To the Christian army, wait a minute. I kind of got, to the Christian armed for defense and battle, the apostle recommends only one weapon of attack, but it is enough the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It subdues and mortifies evil desires and blasphemy thoughts as they, as they rise within and answers unbelief and error as they assault from without. A single text well understood and rightly applied at one at once destroys a temptation or an objection and subdues the most formidable adversary. Prayer must fasten at all the other parts of our Christian army. There are other duties of religion and of other st our stations in the world, but we must keep up times of prayers. Those set in solemn prayer may not be seasonable when other duties are to be done. Yet short, pious prayers darted out always are on. We must use holy thoughts in our ordinary course. A vain heart will be vain in prayer. We must pray with all kinds of prayer, public, private, secret, social, solitary, solemn, and sudden with all the parts of prayer, confession of sin, petitions for mercy, like have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy on this world, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And we must do it by the grace of God, the Holy Spirit, and dependence on and according to his teaching. We must per per persevere in particular requests, notwithstanding discouragements, we must pray, not for ourselves only, but for all saints. Our enemies are mighty, and we are without strength, but our Redeemer is almighty, and in the power of his mighty we may overcome. Wherefore, we must stir up ourselves. Have not, have not we, when God has called, has called, often neglected to answer? Let us think upon these things and continue our prayers with patience. The gospel was a mystery till made known by divine revelation. It is the work of Christ's ministers to declare it. The best and most eminent ministers need the prayers of believers. Those particularly should be prayed for who are exposed to great hardships and perils in their work. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith. By peace, understand all manner of peace. Peace with God, peace of conscience, peace among themselves, and the grace of the Spirit, producing faith and love and every grace. These he desires for those in whom they were already begun. And all grace and blessings come to the saints from God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace, that is, the favor of of God and all good spiritual and temporal which is from it and shall be with all those who does love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity with them only. May God bless you and I pray that you this lesson has helped you. I know I've learned every time I read I learn something new every day. And I want to give you praise, Lord, for what I have learned. In Jesus' name, amen. And God bless you.